the Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Dragons and Trees Living in Harmony. Where were you in 1632? Not working as a night soil porter, I hope. A constellation of stories, a gird up your loins Cree decor, plus part 47 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. We talked with Sharon Lee and Steve Miller this time about their new Leaden Universe short story collection. This is a Leaden Universe Constellation, Volume 2, from which title you might imagine there's a Volume 1, and you would be right. With Volume 2, Bain has collected all the Leaden Universe short fiction that Sharon and Steve have written, to this point at least. There are some great stories in this book, and we'll talk about them with Sharon and Steve, and about the Leaden universe in general. But first, Bain editorial assistant Christopher Cifani joins me for the news. Hey, check out the Bain.com website for our monthly free fiction and free nonfiction. This month we have a cool story from Sharon Lee. Yes, that's the same Sharon Lee we're about to speak with in our interview. Sharon writes the Leaden Universe books with her husband Steve Miller, but she's also the creator of the Archer's Beach Contemporary Fantasy series. Our story this month is set in the Archer's Beach world, which is small-town Maine but with a touch of magic and fairy. It's really a touching piece about rescuing someone's life with the power of music. The story is called The Gift of Music, and if you like the story, you can check out Sharon's new Archer's Beach novel. It's called Carousel Sun, and it's the sequel to last year's Carousel Tides. What else have we got, Christopher? Our nonfiction this month is From Smart Flesh to Custom Organs, The Growing Science of Tissue Engineering, and it's a piece by experimental neurologist Ted Roberts, so he knows whereof he speaks. And we continue with Tom Cratman's eponymous series, Training for War. Yeah, we're enjoying that one, and it will continue for a couple more entries as well. All of those are on the Bain.com website and will soon be available for download at BainEbooks.com in our free fiction and nonfiction anthologies. It's good stuff, so check it out. Hey, the contest this month is now underway. Oh, is it? It sure <laughs> is. This one is fun. Uh, it's called Where Were You in 1632? The Contest. The idea is that people who love Eric Flint's Ring of Fire series, and particularly the first book in the series, 1632, will send in a paragraph on how they discovered the series and came to enjoy it. The winner will receive one of the new signed leather-bound hardcover editions of 1632 that Bain is bringing out this month. Have you seen that yet, Christopher? Um, yeah, I saw them when they came in. They look real nice. Yeah, they're cool. Uh, the contest is certainly open to newbies to the 1632 series. And we're after the best written and most entertaining stuff we can get. You can find a link to the contest on the Bain.com website right over there in the left sidebar. So go ye and check it out. I want to welcome Sharon Lee and Steve Miller back to the podcast. Hi, Sharon and Steve. Hi, Tony. Hi there. Hi there. Also, uh, Editor Emeritus Hank Davis joins us today. Hello, Hank. Hi, Hi Hank. There. Hi, guys. Hey there. Now, Sharon Lee and Steve Miller began co-authoring their tales of the Leaden universe 25 years ago. Is that right? 26 now. 26. Yeah. Uh, the series went through a number of publishers until Bain Books saw a wonderful opportunity to reissue uh, the backlist and to ask Sharon and Steve to write more Leaden universe novels. For the past few years, they've done exactly that with Leaden novels, Fledgling, Saltation, Mouse and Dragon, Ghost Ship, Dragon Ship, and Trade Secret. Trade Secret just hit the locust um, number one in hardcover. Yeah, congratulations. Excellent. The previous Leaden Universe novels that Sharon and Steve have written, which seem to be as many as the stars sometimes, have also been collected into Bane omnibus editions, such as Crystal Variation, Dragon Variation, and, and others. 
You can find them all on the Bane website, of course. Sharon is also the creator of the Archer's Beach Contemporary Fantasy series. Carousel Sun is now out. This is book two in the Archer's Beach series. Finally, there's what we're talking about today. Bain is putting out the collected short stories of the Leaden universe in two omnibus trade paperback volumes. Volume one was out in 2013, and now volume two is out at booksellers everywhere. This is space opera on a grand scale with a setting that is the background for all the stories in the collection. This is space opera on a grand scale with a setting that is the background for all the stories in the collection. Uh, the Leaden universe reminds me of Faulkner and his Yachtmouth Batalfa County and its scope and its adherence to the single well-developed setting. Why has this setting been so fruitful for y'all for all these years? Well, to begin with, it lets us know that we don't have to explain everything over to all of the readers all of the time. Um, we have a, a fair number of people who've been following our stories along since 1988 when the first book came out, and uh, we've put energy into certain concepts, and then so, <clears throat> pardon me, our regular readers come on through, and they they know where they know where we're where we're what we're working with to begin with, and also because we're we're comfortable with it, we don't have to uh, in our own heads we don't have to re-explain the entire universe every time. We we can sit down and know where we're working. It's like if if you were working in a newsroom, which we both have done, sitting down to explain something happening in your local town. You don't have to explain all the details to to somebody new. Well, we don't have to explain it to ourselves either. And and it's a writer's trick. If we know that we're working in the Leaden universe, people speak in a certain way, people behave in a certain way, and we, we know that. We don't have to rebuild it every time. Um, there's there's something about as a reader coming back to that that just feels feels good. You know, you know where you are, um, you can you can fit in, and uh, you don't have to uh, assimilate this thing either. Right, it, it feels comfortable. You know where you are. You know who the, you know how people are expected to act, and you immediately know if someone's not acting as they should. Yeah. Uh, well, I thought we'd talk about some of the specific stories and characters in a Leiden Universe Constellation Volume 2. These include several of the Corval. Is it Corval? I always, I have it in my head as certain some, something, but I don't know if I pronounce it correctly. It's Clan Corval. Corval. Um, as you might expect, uh, there's a bunch of Corval characters, Val Khan and Pat Wren. But there also are a wonderful host of other characters in these stories, perhaps minor characters from a Leiden novel, uh, who get their own point of view and tell their own stories uh, as well. My favorite of these has to be Miri, the Miri stories, the little fiery little redhead from the slums of Sherbleek. Of course, she's a major character. Uh, if you love stories about orphans finding a way out of poverty and uh, destitution, you'll love this one. But there are lots more, such as, for instance, Ennis, uh, in Veil of the Dancer. This is, uh, can you folks explain this world Ennis inhabits and why a girl like her is doomed there? Um, this is the one about uh, the girl that finds the... Oh, I remember the yeah. <laughs> we're, 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 uh, uh, First, I think it's supposed to be sort of from the, from the Spanish and, and, and Arabic side, so it's Ines. Ines, yes. Ah, uh, Ines. My sister-in-law is named Ines, so I just went, uh, <laughs> went there. Uh, this, this story came to largely to Sharon to begin with, because she had been working with the the, the conflict between uh, smart pe- where smart people are pushed into small roles in, in society or dumb roles in society, and the fact that some some people simply accept those roles that are pushed upon them, and 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 other people uh, don't necessarily. And and some people and part part of this came from um, <clears throat> my. Um, Love affair with the um, the Arabian Nights because um, I want I wanted to write a story that sounded like a fairy tale. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the city of Iravati, on the world of Skardu, there lived a scholar who had three daughters, and they were the light and comfort of his elder years. Oh, good, a fairy tale. Um, and then what actually happens to girls who are in the harem? They're not taught to read. They're not taught to reason. And a girl who is given the skills of a boy 
which Inez has been given by her father, who is doing this in order to show her that she's inferior. He keeps trying to give her problems that she can't solve and alphabets that she can't decipher, and she keeps figuring it out. And he finally accepts her, accepts that she has a boy's mind, and he decides to train her as a scholar, which is fine for as long as he's alive. Um, <clears throat> but society expects her to be um, illiterate and obedient. Yeah, and she's basically chattel in this society, or possession of uh, of of. Right. She she has no. Her only existence is through the man who's in charge of her. Um, so while her father's alive, she's fine, but if her father dies and he's elderly, she becomes the property of her brother-in-law, who is not quite so open-minded. So that's why she's doomed. But, but there is a possibility that she'll get out. We, we, I don't want to give too much away, but uh, oh, I don't <laughs> this is the Lee Aiden universe, and, and this is not the only world in the, in the galaxy, right? Right. Um, it's, it's a back world, basically. Um, people do come to trade, but it's understood that they're unclean and they can't leave the port. A big theme that runs through all the stories is loyalty, finding a person whom you can trust. Uh, in Quiet Knives, for instance, pilot Midge Rolani receives a message from an old friend and lover, Cor or Cora. Corey. Corey, <clears throat> who is also a judge. Um, they haven't seen one another in years, but he's in trouble and he needs help and He's been kidnapped. Corey has been kidnapped by uh, a guy named Chairman Troger. Sharon and Steve, can you explain what Midge's friend Cora really is? What's a judge in the Leaden universe? In, in this case, uh, Corey was uh, kidnapped because he wasn't, not because he was a judge, but because he was the judge's pilot and uh, uh. was therefore considered to, have, uh, considered to have secrets and to be somebody that could uh, be, be used as a weapon. Uh, and in this case, we're we're talking a, a judge from the uh, from the Juntavas, and the Juntavas is an international crime group, international intergalactic <laughs> crime group. And uh, <clears throat> the Juntavas uh, has has understood that in order to uh, maintain their particular set of, of uh, rules and regulations, there has to be somebody. Uh, above the local group, in effect, above the local, the equivalent of a capo, there's got to be somebody who can go in and wrestle a situation where two or three or four capos may be uh, involved and who has that, that authority from the person at the, all the way at the top in, and, and has to be seen. So this pilot will have, of course, uh, been witness to many of these, to many of these things and uh, would have an understanding. Uh, pilots are, are not dumb people anyway, and so that would have an understanding of where the, the judge was going, what the judge thought, how, how the judge leaned, and, and thus was, was a, a powerful, a, a, a more than a pawn uh, in, in, in the universe. Now, pilots in, in the Lian universe are... Um, able to do complicated math in their heads, right? It's the, it's a very specialized... Uh... That's right. They, they can do piloting equations in their heads. Um, and um, don't ask me how that works, because I, I can just about add. Um, yeah. well, I, I was wondering if they're... I mean, you don't have to tell us, but if they were genetically engineered or if this was a new species entirely that could do that, because I know I couldn't... Uh, I couldn't do differential equations in my head. In in part, uh, we like to play with uh, we, we like to play with uh, stereotypes, and we come from the space opera background. In in the case of the piloting, that also includes the kind of uh, rip roaring things that you might have had from a, a Kimball Kennison from from Doc Smith. Right. Yeah. Always bigger, faster. Not necessarily bigger, but they were, they were faster, brighter, able to, you know, more resistant to everything. And so uh, that was part of the the way we we dealt with it. That there would be levels of pilots, and once you got to be a first class pilot or a master pilot or a scout pilot, uh, you you were talking with somebody who was far above the ordinary, uh, in the ordinary. Um, uh, 
person in terms of being able to look into a, a situation uh, and, and plot out events and plot out what was going to be going on. Plus, I used to work for um, a gaming company that had been um, founded by a, a fighter pilot, a jet pilot, um, who had managed to survive his tours of duty. Um, <clears throat> so I got to see first firsthand the um, mystique in which they wrap themselves, and, you know, we're just faster, better than anybody. And in a lot of cases, they can back it up. Um, so we just we just did the, if this goes on. Ah, uh, so they're the top guns of space. Right, yeah. Uh, the right stuff. Another thing I've, I've wondered about uh, in the Leiden novels is, uh, is how healing works. Now, you have a story called This House, um, where uh, a main character, Mil Tan, uh, is a healer, storyteller, uh, cross. Maybe you can explain that. Okay. Uh, he, um, his his um, ability to heal people comes, <clears throat> comes through his ability to tell stories. Um, we all know musicians that we put on when we feel bad. We want to hear their music because it makes us feel better. Um, he tells stories, and he can um, influence people's um, emotions through his stories. And, and he can not only influence people's emotions through his stories, but his, he's an empath of a high degree. So when he's telling the story, he can see people's reactions to a story and, in effect, lean in to how they're how they're doing the same way a, a storyteller can tell the same story to a group of 12 year olds and a group of 29 year olds and it's the same story but it's very different because the emphasis is different the and he has uh, <clears throat> he has that kind of uh, empathic response on the larger scale of what healers are in the Leiden universe they are in fact uh, superior empaths with in some cases, an actual ability to, to in effect, reach into somebody's psyche and uh, smooth over a rough spot to reach in and say, okay, this person is really hurting about this. But, you know, if they, if in six years this will not hurt so much and they can sort of go in and help that person put get a, that distance, that... that uh, put a right patina now. of time. Uh, so the, the healers, uh, it's not... We we don't want it to be seen as simple magic, but it's a, it it is to some degree a psychic and empathic uh, thing, and and we use it throughout the, the from from very very early on in the universe. We've been using this, uh, this in, device. In one of the early novels, um, one of the characters has <clears throat> been close to violence, and she's a Terran, and the Leiden character is horrified. That her employer has not has not offered her a healer to help her work through this um, because it's uncivilized not to do that. So you have but this uh, in this house is a is a really nice dilemma story or paradox story story as well because uh, your main character has the the dilemma that if he helps someone he's he's hurting himself. And no, it's, we we should mention that there's a, a an additional story to the story in this case. <laughs> Uh, the the singer songwriter well known international star uh, Janice Ian had a few years ago put together an anthology along with um, Mike Resnick, I believe, uh, called um, Stars. Stars, and she uh, she said she threw the possibility open to to the world. In essence, if you're a professional writer and you know my music, write a story about one of my songs. And that, that sounded cool, and we were kind of interested, and we let her know that we'd be interested. And then she came to us and she said, I want you to, you two to write a story about this song. About this house, because it's one of my favorite songs. No pressure, right? <laughs> okay, that's really cool. And so we, we were given uh, the, the song, This House, to, to work from, and uh, specifically. So we, we, had, we did have some, some necessity... Uh, to be working with the song, but we also and and the uh, the power of the song, but we also had the necessity to make it part of the Lee Aiden universe and, and to work with it, and that seemed the the kind of conflict you're you're discussing uh, is exactly the kind of conflict uh, we we could imagine empaths getting into the 
the uh, ethics of the situation required a certain <clears throat> a certain set of actions. Well, and doctors, I mean, your best, your um, worst enemy has come through and come through the emergency room in your ambulance. Do you just let him die, or do you do what a doctor does? Um, yeah, it's, it's it's even better set up because the uh, there's not a bad guy here. No, it's, and it's it's just it's really a heart wrenching little tale. Um, really good. The uh, now Mary, let's Mary is a character that's threaded throughout this collection, and it was wonderful to to be able to follow her along as she grew up and became quite the power in the Leaden galaxy. Uh, we first meet her on Sherbleek, uh, a planet where she's very young and in great danger. Uh, of having her life ruined or, or ended. Um, maybe without too many spoilers, can you describe Mary for us, what she's like and what she's, she's what her potential is? Um, well, we, we um, grew up in Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> we, we grew up in Baltimore. Uh, I grew up in a, uh, in a kind of a strange situation is that my, my parents moved out of a very bad section of Baltimore when I was fairly young. But my aunt lived on the border of of that uh, that territory, and I used to go and spend summers and and often holidays and such with with my aunt, uh, right on the border of that territory. It was the kind of territory where the uh, young man uh, who lived next door uh, ended up in reform school, and by the time he was in seventh or eighth grade, and um, in prison by the time he was. Uh, 20 or 21, and a number of the people, that, and I hung out with those people. I, I, I used to, quote, run with the crowd there. So we knew people who were uh, young and tough and in trouble before they knew there was trouble, bef- before they knew it wasn't anything. And so she sort of came out of, of some of that, uh, that kind of uh, background and knowledge, I think, is the tough streets of the city. And uh, Sharon lived in a in a portion of town that was a little better, but we're, we're talking uh, what we ended up using in the entire series, too. We're talking really discreet neighborhoods. Uh, you, you had your block or your two blocks, and everybody there kind of hung together, and you were sort of forced to hang together, while two blocks over was another, was another turf, in effect. And uh, we, we very much understood the, the ethos of... of uh, West Side Story, for example, because that was the kind of group area that we had kind of come from. And Miri came from that background. So she was a tough little kid who got in a really serious uh, situation and um, just reacted. And that put her on, put her on a, particular, a particular path. And that, that path ended up, of course, taking her off planet. Uh, she's got also great courage and... Um, and 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 smarts as well. She's 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 just a wonderful little character to follow through. And that is, as a reader, I identified with her a lot. Good, we're doing it right. Yes. Now there are a, are a bunch of stories that take place during. I guess you call it the the uh, Clan Corval diaspora. Um, can you diaspora? Can you explain this era in uh, Leiden history? What what has happened to Corval? What's Plan B? Why is Pat Wren on Sherbleek? Um, plan B is the clan where the fam- that the family all knows that scatters them if the clan is being threatened by an overwhelming enemy. Um, it sends the children to a safe place. It sends the treasures of the clan, which are the children and the old people, to a safe place um, where they are completely hidden, and it um, scatters the adults, the um, active adults, to points where they can snipe at their enemy and take care of the problem so that they can um, regroup. Um, sadly, what has happened to Clan Corval is that their enemy was on Liad, and through a series of um, problems, they wind up, a series of necessary circumstances, a very Liadan way of putting it, they wind up um, putting a hole in the home world, and for this they are um, thrown off world reasonably enough. Um, and they have relocated to Shorebleek, Mary's, Mary's old old home world. What is uh, Shorebleek like? 
what it sure looks like. It's like Baltimore. It's Baltimore. Um, <laughs> they've gone it, to Baltimore. It's Port City. Um, it, it, it's considered, a, a, in effect, a, an industrial, uh, hard scrabble kind of an area, except that uh, it's been, it's also been isolated. That it was built up to do a certain function, to supply a certain, uh, Timonium to, a, a certain um, mineral, and, and then the company that was that was doing it fell in uh, fell apart because somebody discovered you know a whole bunch of of this particular mineral out there rolling around in in meteor um, uh, in, in meteor groups without any need to go to a planet to go find it you could just go out and shove it into your ship and take it away so that company went out of business and in effect that the world was essentially were very nearly abandoned. They, they abandoned the, col- the colonist workers and just left. <laughs> and and so Shurbleek became a a, uh, a a desperate kind of a place. And it's uh, it's sort of a Baltimore or Pittsburgh move to uh, a Murmansk location geographically, mm-hmm. uh, meteorologically. There's a a lot of snow. There's a lot of ice. Uh, there's not much good a gro- good growing season. And so you, you've got a, a, um, uh, a displaced and, and m- mainly unworking workforce, and uh, so that that's kind of how it grew into the strangeness that it became. Um, and the boss, the boss culture actually happened because we had you know division bosses and bosses um, of mining crews and bosses of this and bosses of that. So they tried to maintain the structure even as everything is falling apart around them. Ah, so that's why they call them boss. And Pat Wren, uh, since Corville comes there, relocates part part of it, um, has to deal with that boss culture as well. Well, in the midst of, without giving too much of the novels away, <clears throat> what happens is that during the during the Plan B, Patron was needing a a place to go to, where he would not be obvious, and also a place where he would likely be able to pull, uh, throw his weight around in effect, and and to put himself in a position to to become a controlling force. He was looking at becoming. Uh, in effect, he was looking at becoming a dictator and and, and uh, <clears throat> taking and, over. And the reason he needed to do that is because Petron had come to believe that his entire family, that Plan B had failed, that his entire family, except him, um, has been killed, and he needs to exact balance. And, and so there's it's it's a it's it's an extremely complex situation, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's why it took some part of the reason it took so many books to to get there. But uh, yeah, it's a um. And, and so he has he has come to the place with the idea that he's going to look for allies, and then when he finds out that it's in in such bad uh, arrangement, he he finds out the only way to do it is to put himself in charge, yeah, become the godfather of this place. Yeah, the boss of bosses. Um. Well, um, there's a lot of stories in the, in the collection that are set on Sherbleek or have characters um, <clears throat> there. The uh, for instance, the story that emphasizes how damn cold it is is the one with the cab driver. Um, she's a wonderful character. I'm trying to remember her name now. I don't know if I have it written down. Uh, she it, most of it takes place on on Liad 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 Virtu Liad yes Virtu, uh, but um, she she ends up on Sherbleek and and just uh, her description of how she has to wrap herself up to go outside is um, just makes you cold. <laughs> well, and that story is actually a direct outgrowth of of uh, Vertu, with, without uh, getting too much detail, shows up in a novel. And what happened to us was that while we were writing and continuing the series, she had to ferry somebody around on the planet. And after that novel was over, people kept writing to us and asking us. They'd come up to us at convention and say, whatever happened to the cab driver? <laughs> and the cab driver was only on, quote, on screen for about three and a half pages, maybe not even that much. But she was attitudinal. She was attitudinal. She was there. She was accessible, and people just fell in love with her. They expected to see more of her. And so when when it came down to what happened to the cab driver, oh, I know what happened to the cab driver, and and so that's that's how that uh-huh. that story was written. 
where did Yuli come from? Now that's a one, another wonderful story, um, th- which is set on Sure Bleak. He's he's kind of out in the boonies, or what are the boonies now? Uh, out at the end of the road. Yeah, uh, Yuli is is uh, an outgrowth. I, we've written a number of stories that are uh, outgrowth of my uh, my experience around the the fringes of things. Uh, I had worked for a while with. In, in Maine with a, um, an agency that taught people with disabilities, both um, physical and, and emotional, how to use computers, how to use the computers to contact other people. And I was brought into, for, for a number of years, I worked with people who were, uh, I, I, I must say, they were socialized differently. They didn't think the same way other people did. They didn't necessarily react the same way that other people did. But we still tried to bring those kinds of people, quote, into our stories because those kinds of people are, exist. And Yuli was one of those kinds of people. He was he was a person, uh, the, the one group used to talk about people who, and so he could, people who experience sudden fear, uh, passion, panic, whatever, and uh, so Yuli was was an example of people who, and uh, he he walked on the stage again because of one of the novels. He he kind of walked on the stage and said, "Here I am." And so we used him in the novel. And then afterwards, it was a case of, but Yuli is in an important place. He's in an important location. He's, and so it was necessary to um, to can you work continue working with Yuli. And Yuli is a man who doesn't like change, and he's about to have an <laughs> asteroid deliver a house and a big tree right next door in the old quarry. He's um he has a really like a winning sincerity too, and he's he's kind of a Forrest Gump type in a way. In that um... yeah, that that's funny because I've never seen Forrest Gump. <laughs> Well, he's got that. He, he's not going to lie because he doesn't really know how to lie, and so he tells the truth, and and you can trust him in his perceptions about things, even if he doesn't understand everything entirely. Yes, he's a lot of fun. Um, there are a couple of stories in here that are kind of tangential, but I think are wonderful uh, to the Leaden centered tales. One of these is uh, one of these is about the Kapuri called Necessary Evils. The Kapuri, the Kapuri actually. Um came out of a failed first start for Crystal Soldier, in which Contra is <clears throat> um, black trading, and they have Contra, her brother has taken on um, a cargo, and he has gotten himself lost, and she goes to find out, she goes into the hole to find out what he has, and he has one of these constructs, these, these um, women, and uh, women, um, plant women constructs who help with wine, who help grow vines and who can enhance the um, vitality of your of your vines. And these things are expensive, and they are worth somebody's life to be trying to to smuggle one of these things. And she thinks her brother has lost his mind. So that's where they came from. Mm-hmm. But that didn't get published. That one, that didn't, that did not get published. Um, however, they were great. Um, I really liked them. So that story is actually set before, or during the time of Contrary of Selling, before they cross over into the what is now the Leiden universe. Ah, okay. So this is um, this is way in the past. It's ancient history. Uh. Yes. Well, they're one. They're sort, they're sort of uh, vineyard dryads, um, and, but they're they're dangerous, just like dryads. <laughs> you could say. Can be. Uh, it's a it's a great story. Um, we do play with that, by the way, um, in a number of our stories. The uh, the idea that somebody says, "Oh, this is how it is," and look how sweet it is, and we'll say, "Yeah, you think it's sweet? This is how it would be." <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and that was one of those stories, yeah. I think. Yeah, let's let's take this off. Let's let's do the if this goes on. <laughs> this points out another. There's an indentured servant in this story. Then there's something that runs through Leaden stories. There, there are noble houses, trade guilds, and in Selton, the the woman in the story's case, indentured servants. Are are these merely storytelling creations, or do you think maybe we'll see a return to these sorts of social arrangements again in the in the human future? Uh, I, I I don't 
don't understand why you why you say return to. Um, actually, because these these conditions already exist in the world now. Just because we're we happen to be, if you and I and 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 Sharon or Hank are living in a place where you're not supposed to have indentured servants, don't doesn't mean that there aren't already people now who are living under those conditions. But one gets the have, one gets the feeling where I mean, in in the history in the Western perception, we're moving away from that. That's not. Uh, uh, well, I understand that that I, I understand that that's that's an assumption. But the the as far as as we're concerned, and, and in working with these kinds of topics, uh, we we do see people who 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 are stuck, and we we have no reason to believe that the um, that the greater humanity is, is necessarily going to <laughs> to win. So it's it's not what... Western civilization is going to win. Yeah, so at, at this point, um, you can call it a storytelling device, but it's it's also a, a, an application of what of, of what's, uh, in effect, an application of what's visible. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we, we try not to shy away from it. At the same time, we don't try to... Uh, I think we try not to romanticize it. There are, there are places on Earth right now where, where slavery and cell phones coexist. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. And so we, we, we try to deal with these things as, as sort of as facts rather than as um, suppositions. Yeah. So uh, I think my favorite story in this collection, and it took me a while to get into it, but I ended up loving it, is Dragon Tide. Now, I believe this takes place on the planet, uh, is it Klamath or Klamath? The planet's Klamath, but the wrong planet. Yeah, the planet that you're trying for is Klamath. However, this is actually another one of the stories that takes place in the in the prior universe. Ah, okay. This this is a story that takes place on the world where Crystal Soldier and uh, Crystal Dragon are, in, in essence, in, on the world where Crystal Soldier starts, where the where the first thing we see is. Uh, a, an explorer wandering a desolate world, trailing this, uh, well, following a trail of, do- of dead trees, understanding that he's seeing a pattern, and then he comes upon the tree, which of course becomes Corval's tree, way down in the f- way down in the future. And um, this is this is um, the world that we're we're dealing with, and what we wanted to do. Uh, we had been talking on a train trip that we needed to get one more story in about um, not only about the tree but about the tree's remembrance of dragons, and we needed to get that story in. And we were talking on the train, and we were driving, we were riding along, and I looked down into a river valley uh, where there had been a flood, and I, I probably sat there and stared out the river valley for about seven minutes, and I said, I think I have this story, <laughs> and. The, the story kind of fell together um, rather rather ra- rapidly, and uh, we needed to be able to 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 show that the tree had already been uh, involved with thinking creatures and had been involved with social creatures, which of course we we don't think of trees as being, and thus had some. Uh, expectations, not only expectations, but also some sympathy and empathy, and that's where that story uh, that story yeah, well, came it, out of. It has a almost uh, symbiotic relationship with its dragon in the story, or this beast that we you call a dragon. We're calling we're calling dragon because yeah. uh, this is the interpretation put upon it by the people who come along and who, who become Corval and, and etc. And looked at this this mind picture and went, oh, it's a dragon. And the tree goes, okay, fine, it's a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's wonderful that they get inside that sort of alien uh, mentality of, of the beast. And, and by the end, you're just rooting for it. Well, he's the hero. You should root yes, for him. Yes, of course. <laughs> Um, another favorite of mine, and now I thought I thought that this was a, a shadow story for uh, for Dragon Tide. This is the story of Miri um, Misfits. It's, it's called where we uh, meet a new main character, uh, the Leiden weatherman Ikiad Bruner. I guess this is just a cool tale of two characters who are seeing a catastrophe. One of them's in it, and one of them's way above it. But um, they become friends even though they've barely met. I was also uh, 
reminded of that Bruce Willis uh, <laughs> um, disaster movie where the cop is outside and he's inside. Uh, can can y'all give us the background on this one? Well, we we had known that Ickleyad Brunner had existed for a for a long time. He's in Mary's he's in Mary's history, um, and as so often happens, we were searching because oh, we wrote this one for Bain. We we wrote this one for for the Bain Online Magazine, um, and we were invited to write a story, and we said, oh, this will be a perfect time to write about the weatherman. We've never had a chance to actually get the weatherman into a novel, and he's such an interesting character, and it's such an interesting setup, and we can explore Mary's um, little adventure there on Klamath at the same time. We had also, um, <clears throat> unbe- unbeknownst to, largely to the world until about six or eight months ago, we had uh, tried to get the Klamath story down on any number of occasions. We, we've probably written a thousand words of the Klamath story previously. Uh, a, thousand, a thousand pages, rather, of the Klamath, uh, of the Klamath story. We had, uh, I, I have sitting in my room now, uh, and out where I can see them, probably 150 or 200 pages worth of starts, and there are three different starts. So we knew that we knew the over the overall happening there because she had uh, she Miri had already told Valcon this is what happened, uh, but we needed a way to to including including the weatherman got us off. Yeah, the weather the weatherman got us off, and so when we started the story, we had to give poor Mr. Brunner. Um, he we knew where he had to get to, and we also knew he was going to suffer for it. And so that's where we oh, had yeah. to, uh, part of where we, we came from no, there. No good deed going unpunished. Yeah. But, but he, um, he grows during the story. It, it's, it's a wonderful story of, of a kind of science-based character who doesn't really uh, know his feelings coming into being able to, to have them. He doesn't do people, and especially he doesn't do Terran people. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that's interesting, too, because we're, we're, um, we're weather watchers uh-huh. for the... Uh, uh, and we we pour it in periodically if we see strange things like we see hail or if uh, uh, we'll we'll measure the hail we'll go out if, if there's a sudden snow and they expect three inches and we end up with thirty two I go outside and measure to see how many inches it is and report exactly where we are so that they can follow the patterns and we we from time to time we've met a number of the meteorologists and uh, we sent a copy of this story and in fact it was dedicated to the uh, in a, in a chapbook, it was dedicated to the local people in Gray, Maine, the weather people. And uh, I got a phone call from the we- from the weather bureau. Uh, the the one gentleman called me up and said, "If you want to come down and visit, why don't you do that?" So we got an invitation to go by and go down to the weather and, and get a and, tour. And this this gentleman is one of the um, people who does. Uh, from time to time goes off and does the hurricane forecasting and stuff like that on on TV you'll see him so we we were um, we thought that was good he apparently was interested in, in how we worked with the weather and how we had Ickley and Brunner either that or he decided we really needed to be educated <laughs> well that, you really are weather nerds <laughs> yes that's cool. Well, the book, it, it's a great collection of short stories set in the Leiden Universe. It's called Leiden Universe, A Leiden Universe Constellation, Volume 2. It's by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Volume 1 is already out, and you can get them both at booksellers everywhere. Sharon and Steve, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Here's another cut from Gray Reinhardt's excellent album, Truth, Lies, and Make-Believe. Gray is the unsolicited submissions editor here at Bain, and he's also a talented and much-in-demand filker at many East Coast science fiction conventions. This cut and Gray's album is available at Bandcamp, Amazon, and at Gray's website, graymanwrites.com. This one is in a bit more serious vein, with perhaps a high fantasy heroic theme of human mortality and doing the right thing. It's my favorite song on the album. Here's Gray Reinhardt with Mortal Men. Long 
the night and cold the day and hard the road we travel. Evil's hold upon the land is strong. Duty calls and on we march to join the final battle. To stand our ground defending right from wrong Some of us may be heroes Some of us may be fools We can't know when or where or how we'll fall We face our A thousand separate duels We've heard and we are answering the call We are the mortal men doomed to die The mortal men doomed to die Behind us lies the land we love our homes and precious families Before us lies the clash of sword and shield Our blood may run from hot to cold But our resolve is granite To hold our ground and never once to Some of us may be heroes, some of us may be fools, we can't know when or where or how we'll fall. We face our foes with honor, a thousand separate duels, we've heard There's nothing we can do But to live our lives And fight our fights And love the best way we know how Will they greet us in Valinor? Send us to the timeless halls No matter For the time that counts is now Where some of us may be heroes And some of us may be fools And we can't know when or where We face our foes with honor In a thousand separate duels For we have heard and we are answering the call We are the mortal men doomed to die The mortal men doomed to die are the mortal men doomed to die the mortal men doomed to die
And now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Okay, here's what has gone before. After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's star kingdom of Manticore has entered into a simmering conflict with the ancient aristocratic Solarian League. The Solarian League is crumbling, and at the edge of its empire, rebellion is brewing. The Solarian Office of Frontier Security is in charge of keeping the peace on the verge. Brutal tactics and puppet dictatorships are par for the course for the OFS. Royal Manticoran Navy Admiral Michelle Hinka, Countess Gold Peak, commands the Royal Manticoran Navy forces in the Talbot Quadrant, a region allied with the Star Kingdom and on the border of the restive frontier of Solarian space. When Gold Peak receives word that a Sali assault on the Manticoran home system has been utterly destroyed, she decides to take action against the Solarian forces in her sector as well, and in the process aid the many rebel groups that have sprung up here at the crumbling edge of Empire. With the bulk of her fleet behind her, Hinka arrives in the Myers system, heart of the outermost quadrant of Sali space. The Sali space forces in Myers are caught off guard, but with their engines hot for training exercises, they may have a chance to escape, or even to inflict major damage on Gold Peak's fleet. Gold Peak is just as determined to drive the Sollies back once and for all. The climactic battle is at hand. Here's part 47 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. Chapter 34 Michelle Hankey rose behind her desk as her day cabin's door opened. The man who stepped through it was of average height, with the dark hair and eyes which seemed to be the norm here on the planet of Myers. He was well-dressed, although the cut of his clothing was a tea-year or two out of date by the latest core world fashions, and he extended a well-manicured hand as he approached her. "'Prime Minister Montview,' she said, reaching out her own hand. His grip was surprisingly firm, not the perfunctory squeeze too many politicians had perfected from too many tea years of shaking voters' hands, and his dark eyes met hers. "'Admiral Goldpeak,' he responded. Please have a seat, she invited, reclaiming her hand and indicating the pair of armchairs arranged on either side of the coffee table. Thank you. Montview accepted the invitation, and Chris Billingsley appeared as if by magic. Michelle Stewart was resplendent in perfectly turned-out mess dress uniform, with a white towel over his left forearm, which ought to have seemed out of keeping with his battered prizefighter's face, but somehow didn't. He carried a tray of finger sandwiches, which he placed on the coffee table. Then he gathered up the silver coffee pot, embossed with HMS Artemis's crossed arrow coat of arms, and poured two cups. "'Will there be anything else, milady? he inquired. "'Just make sure Alfredo has fresh celery, please, Chris,' Michelle replied. "'Of course, milady. Billingsley bowed slightly to her and to her guest, then withdrew, pausing to check with the tree cat arranged on the perch behind Michelle's desk. Master Sergeant Cognasso just happened to be the Marine sentry posted outside Michelle's cabin door, and Alfredo, celery stalk clutched in hand, watched her and the Prime Minister with apparent indifference. Appearances, of course, could be deceiving. Thank you for coming, Prime Minister, Michelle said as the door closed behind Billingsley. It wasn't exactly as if attendance was discretionary, Admiral, Montview pointed out with a disarming smile. Although the invitation was phrased with Admiral courtesy, I thought. There was no point being impolite, Michelle responded with a smile of her own. Then her smile faded. Of course, I'm afraid we've been rather less polite with some people than with you. I presume that refers to Commissioner Verrocchio and Vice Commissioner Hongbo? Montview inquired, and she nodded. Ah. He nodded, then shrugged slightly. 
Understandable, I suppose. Michelle sat back with her coffee cup, studying him thoughtfully. Thomas Montview was officially the Prime Minister of King Lawrence the Ninth, titular ruler of the Kingdom of Myers, which covered about three-quarters of the surface of the planet of Myers. In fact, Lawrence Thomas and his entire family had been little more than figureheads ever since Frontier Security's arrival in the Myers system. Still, the House of Thomas had provided a useful interface, and the Thomases had survived better than most local dynasties who found themselves engulfed by the protectorate system. They'd actually retained a sizable percentage of the family wealth, and everything Michelle and Cynthia Lecter had been able to find in the local system databases suggested that Lawrence and his parents and grandparents had done their best to mitigate the weight of the OFS yoke for the population of Myers. They'd been active in philanthropic pursuits, and they'd given a great deal of support to public education out of their private coffers. None of which meant they hadn't had to make their own accommodations with the frontier security system, and Montview, as Lawrence's prime minister, had been the primary local frontman for Lorcan Verrocchio's administration. It was apparent that he'd done quite well out of his position, but he was something of a cipher as far as Michelle and Lecter had been able to determine. I'm afraid the two of them— and especially Commissioner Verrocchio, took it rather less philosophically than that, she said now. I'm sure they did. Montview sipped his own coffee. They had so much more to lose, after all, and I feel certain their superiors back on Old Terra are going to have a few harsh words for them as well. He smiled thinly. The one thing you can depend upon is that everyone in OFS has a scapegoat ready and waiting should the need arise. I should take it, then, that you weren't too fond of frontier security? Michelle asked lightly, watching Alfredo out of the corner of her eye. No one who's ever had the dubious privilege of being gathered to frontier security's protective bosom is too fond of it. Montview's tone was as light as Michelle's own, but there was a measured bite buried in it. The more closely you find yourself compelled to work with them, the less fond of them you become, however. Alfredo waved his celery stalk casually, confirming Montview's sincerity. The fact that the Prime Minister didn't care for frontier security didn't automatically make him a paragon of virtue, but it was definitely a point in his favor. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, as it happens, we're not too fond of frontier security or the Solarian League in general at the moment ourselves, Michelle shrugged. I think we can all take it as a given that relations between the Star Empire and the League are going to get worse before they get better. Would you be terribly disappointed, Admiral Goldpeak, if I told you that didn't come as a huge surprise? Montview inquired, and Michelle chuckled. Not at all, Mr. Prime Minister. I only mentioned it as a preface to what I really wanted to speak to you about. She paused, head cocked, and he frowned thoughtfully. Then he shrugged. I would presume that what you're leading up to has to do with the long-term political situation here on Myers, he said, and Michelle nodded. She wasn't really surprised by his comment. She'd already come to the conclusion he was no dummy, but she was pleased by his directness. Precisely, she agreed. At the moment, I have no definitive instructions on political administration of territory captured or liberated from the Solarian League, which, she refrained from mentioning, was because she had no instructions about capturing or liberating that territory in the first place. Because of that, she continued, I'm afraid I'm rather in the position of making things up as I go along. That gives me a certain degree of freedom, although it also obviously means any arrangements I might put in place would be subject to review by higher authority. On the other hand, she looked directly into Montview's eyes, there aren't a great many higher authorities in the Star Empire. Montview sat back in his chair, sipping coffee and regarding her thoughtfully. It was clear to Michelle that he'd done his homework on her just as thoroughly as she'd done hers on him. What she wasn't certain of was whether or not he realized 
she was effectively putting the honor of the House of Winton on the line. She couldn't be certain even Beth would honor every detail of any arrangement to which she committed the Star Empire, but she was positive her cousin would never betray or abandon anyone Michelle had agreed to support. I believe I appreciate your position, milady, Montview said, and Michelle raised mental eyebrows as he addressed her as a member of the Manticoran peerage rather than by her naval rank. Should I conclude from what you've just said that you're considering an arrangement which would involve my king? I am, Michelle confirmed, leaning back in her own chair and resting her elbows on its arms to steeple her fingers in front of her. Of course, the exact nature of that arrangement would depend on a great many factors. Factors such as... Montview raised his eyebrows as he allowed his voice to trail off. At the moment, Mr. Prime Minister, no one outside the Meyer system knows what's happened here. No hyper-capable unit made it out, which means it will be some time, probably T months, in fact, before anyone else realizes anything's happened at all. That gives us some time to work with. Unfortunately, we're in what you might call a dynamic situation, and my military capabilities are a bit lopsided. Michelle showed her teeth briefly. I've got oodles. That's a technical term, Mr. Prime Minister. It means lots and lots of naval combat power, but I'm severely strapped for ground combat power. Montview nodded gravely, although Michelle doubted that he truly realized just how short of ground troops she actually was. Colonel Liam Trondheim, the senior gendarmerie officer present, had surrendered the system to her as soon as her ships entered Meyer's planetary orbit. He hadn't had a great deal of choice about that, under the recognized interstellar laws of war. For that matter, Michelle had been perfectly willing to take out every gendarmerie base on the planet from orbit, also as the interstellar laws of war permitted for planets which didn't surrender, and he seemed to realize that fact. She rather regretted that Brigadier Usel hadn't been here to do the surrendering herself. Everything she and Cynthia Lecter had been able to dig up on the Brigadier suggested she was an ugly piece of work, even by the standards of the Solarian League Gendarmerie. On the other hand, according to Trondheim, one reason he'd been so quick to surrender was that Usel had taken two full battalions of her best troops, although Michelle doubted Usel's definition of best troops would have matched her own, off to the Mobius system. She didn't like to think about what someone like Usel might have been doing with those troops, but she felt confident somehow that Sir Ivar's Tarakov would experience no insurmountable difficulty in dealing with the brigadier. Here in Myers, however, Michelle was left with the problem that she simply didn't have the troop strength to garrison what she'd captured. The planet Myers itself was home to 3.6 billion people. Another 32,000 lived on the next planet out, Socrates, which was very much like the Sol system's Mars, but with a slightly thicker atmosphere. The Truman Belt was home to another 843,000 people, most committed to routine mining and other resource extraction. And then there were the 200,000 living on the moons of the gas giant Damien, mining the planetary atmosphere for hydrogen and rare gases. That wasn't very many people by the standards of one of the League's core worlds, but it very nearly equaled the total population of the Manticore binary system, and there was no way in the universe her own limited marine strength could possibly hope to control them. On the other hand, Frontier Security hadn't been able to ship in enough troops to actually garrison the system either. The Sollies had been forced to rely on local police forces to maintain public order and enforce civil law. That was always the case, of course, but generally those local police forces took their cue from the OFS administration which had co-opted their services— that was one reason Michelle had dreaded what she'd find when they reached Myers, given Usel's reputation. To her surprise, however, local law enforcement appeared to have avoided the brutality and repressiveness she'd anticipated. Partly, that was because Usel had been assigned to the Madras sector fairly recently. Another part of it, she'd been forced to admit, grudgingly, grudgingly, was probably due to Lorcan Verrocchio and Junyan Hongbo. In fact, she suspected more to the vice-commissioner than to Verrocchio, 
although it was early to be drawing that sort of conclusion. But even more of it, she thought, hoped, stemmed from the example of King Lawrence and his family. Michelle Hankey wasn't about to conclude that the Myers police forces were miraculously free of the corruption which followed frontier security like a pestilence, but they clearly took their responsibility as the guardians of public order and safety seriously, and because they did, she was inclined to cut them a substantial amount of slack. The question was who they ultimately answered to. I anticipate receiving additional ground troops as soon as they can be forwarded from the Talbot Quadrant, she continued. There was no need to tell him just how long soon might be. In the meantime, however, we have to make do out of the forces currently available to me, and most of my ground personnel are trained as Marines, as combat troops, not law enforcement personnel. Under the circumstances, I think it would be to everyone's advantage to keep a trained and experienced police force on the job, assuming, of course, she looked into Montview's eyes again, that I could come to some sort of mutually acceptable arrangement with some local authority who could command that police force's loyalty and obedience. Actually, milady, Montview said after a moment, our law officers' formal oaths of office are sworn to the House of Thomas, not to the Solarian League or Frontier Security. It was his turn to show his teeth. An unfortunate oversight on their part. Yes, it was, Michelle agreed. It was also fairly standard operating procedure for OFS, however. The legal fiction that the Protectorates were still independent star systems simply under the protection of the beneficent Solarian League required local regimes. Those regimes were well aware of the fact that they actually possessed no authority of their own, yet the forms were important. Michelle sometimes thought that was due to the Solarian League's unhealthy worship of bureaucratic paperwork, but it was also a fig leaf which could be hauled out if some Solarian newsy muckraker started poking about. Imperialism? Oh, my, no. Perish the very thought. We're simply here as advisors to support yet another neobarb star system in its painful march towards truly representative and democratic government. See? We can't even give any direct orders to the local police force. They all have to go through the local, duly elected government. Should I take it, Mr. Prime Minister, that if I were to recognize— Provisionally, of course. As I say, any decision I make would be subject to review by higher authority. King Lawrence, as the local legitimate head of state, and charge him with creating a provisional government for the entire star system, he would be prepared to accept that responsibility under the protection of the star empire of Manticore? Montview's eyes flickered. For a moment, Michelle wondered why. Then it hit her. Forgive me. She shook her head. That was clumsily phrased, especially in light of your star system's experience of frontier security's notion of protection. She shook her head again. Allow me to clarify what I actually meant. Montview took a slow sip of coffee, then set the cup on the saucer in his lap and nodded. While many of my decisions will be subject to review, Mr. Prime Minister, one thing I can tell you with absolute certainty at this time is that my empress and her government have no intention of adding independent star systems forcibly to the star empire. Nor are we interested in controlling nominally independent star systems through puppet governments and protectorate arrangements. In fact, our recent expansion is going to leave us with some significant problems when it comes to integrating our new citizens into our existing political and economic system. We still don't know how those problems are going to work out, although I'm optimistic that they will work out, but no one in the Star Empire's government is eager to add still more potential headaches to the list. Holding down forcibly annexed populations would probably rate pretty high on anyone's list of headaches, I'd think, and that doesn't even consider the fact that we literally cannot afford to fritter away the military resources we need against something the size of the League by tying them down on occupation duty just to keep our boot on the neck of someone who doesn't want us running their star system. Because of the nature of our conflict with the Solarian League, however, 
it's inevitable that we're going to find ourselves doing very much what we did here, taking star systems away from Solarian control. When that happens, we automatically assume a moral responsibility for the future well-being of those star systems. We don't want our actions to lead to wholesale violence, political instability, or the emergence of warlordism, and that means we can't simply pull back out as soon as the local Sollies surrender. For that matter, if we did any such thing, it would simply invite the Sollies to return to the vacuum we'd leave behind us. As I see it, that means our best course of action is to encourage the formation of stable system governments, independent stable system governments, In many cases, that's going to be very difficult for reasons I'm sure you understand. Michelle's brown eyes turned grim. Frankly, Mr. Prime Minister, the Meyer system's been incredibly fortunate compared to the vast majority of protectorate systems. That's the reason you and I are having this conversation. I believe there's an excellent chance King Lawrence can form a genuine, popularly accepted government with our support— and I'm prepared to offer that support as long as he's committed to forming a government prepared to safeguard its citizens' fundamental civic rights and safety. I am not prepared to support him in the formation of any government which does not safeguard those rights and that safety. She paused to let that last sentence sink in, then leaned forward, resting her elbows on her thighs and clasping her hands under her chin. Should King Lawrence be interested in forming such a government, and should he be prepared to demonstrate guarantees for his subjects' rights and safety, I'm prepared, provisionally, speaking for the Star Empire of Manticore, to acknowledge him as the rightful sovereign of the Meyer system and to offer him a military and economic alliance with the Star Empire. We're not interested in policing, occupying, or owning your planets, Mr. Prime Minister. We are interested in depriving the Solarian League of a foothold here or elsewhere in the Madras sector, and our experience has been that offering a potential ally a helping hand instead of an iron fist is the best way to achieve a stable, long-lasting relationship. You might want to study the relationship we've achieved with the Yeltsin system and the protectorship of Grayson. Montview sat silent, gazing into her eyes very intently for several seconds. Then he drew a deep breath and squared his shoulders. Obviously, I'll have to discuss this with His Majesty, milady. I believe, however, that you'll discover this is no more than what he's always wished it had been within his power to accomplish. I don't say there won't be problems. Among other things... I expect the Damian Moons to argue in favor of independence from the kingdom. That's where the most recalcitrant of our people have relocated since Frontier Security's arrival. They haven't thought much of our inner world softness and collaboration. He smiled briefly. Hard to blame them, really but I've often wondered if they realized how much that collaboration of the kings had to do with frontier securities leaving them alone out there. Aside from that, I think the political equation would work itself out much more smoothly than you might have anticipated. I also think our local police forces would be extremely grateful if we could establish a clear-cut source of local authority as quickly as possible. At the moment, everyone's operating in something of a vacuum, and that means all of them are also looking over their shoulders, wondering what's going to happen if and when you and your ships pull out. Michelle had gazed attentively at and passed him while he was speaking. She'd watched Alfredo the entire time, and the tree cat had sat upright on his perch, his full attention focused on Montview. Now he looked away from the Prime Minister, directly at Michelle, and nodded slowly. In that case, Mr. Prime Minister, Michelle said, I think it would be a good thing if you could arrange a direct meeting between me and the king, 
don't you? That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 47, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Christopher Cifani, to Gray Reinhardt, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a Midwinter's Eve hootenanny filled with Clan Corval traders, sure bleak ragamuffins, Terran pilots, and a band of Maine coons on clavichords, and tail slapping beavers to Leaden Universe co creators Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. 